I am, um, hello, I'm Patrick and I'm not a developer. So I'm actually the nightmare of all developers in my lab because I'm the one who is filling in the timesheets and I'm pushing them to keep with their promises and to keep with the deadlines. So, um, good. So, um, in this particular case, I am representing a particular project which is called Extreme Data Cloud or Ecstasy. It is part of a funding period of the European Commission which is called Horizon 2020. It will end, as you can imagine, in 2020. Good. So these are the people who helped me uh, doing all this, putting all the slides together, but as you don't know those people anyway, you can skip that. So the storyboard for today is um, we will start with information which is mostly interested for people wearing ties. It is about the European Open Science Cloud, and then when we move along and we talk about a particular project within this framework, and then going deep into what we actually do, the interesting part for developers and so forth, about development integration, storage orchestration, quality of service for storage, and then coming to the reason why I'm here. It is about a CDMI extension which we are using, and then ending up again, some people with bearing ties for what we are going for is the EU-wide storage brokering system, based on all this here. Okay, good. If you're not interested, you can leave now. Good. Um, so first of all, some numbers for those of you who like numbers. Just to put this in, in perspective, the European Commission is spending 160 billion euros per year. This is the budget they have, just to, to that you know what we are talking about in general. Now, the budget for, the, for open science is that what they spend in order to, to support science and open science is 24 billion euros per seven years. Our plans are not five years, but our plans are, are going every, every seven years we have a new a funding period. Good. So, so just are there British people here? A billion is a thousand million. I know the Americans know that. Good. Um, the expected budget for FP9, which is the, the starting in 2020, is a little bit higher, but if you reduce the inflation, this is essentially the same. Good. That means it, we did good in the past, so we, we will get at least the same money as we did in the past. Good. And scientists can ask for this money already, the FP9 one. However, there, is, there are strings attached. If you want this money, what you have to do is, from, from then on, it's mandatory to use open access to publications. So there's no way you publish somewhere where the general public doesn't have access to. Secondly, it's mandatory to present a data management plan with the fair principles. So findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable, you know this. Good. So if this is not part of your proposal, you won't get the money. Third, there has to be a reward system, but that's kind of not so important. But the very last one is the most important bit. You have to use the European Open Science Cloud for your computing and for your storage. Now, the question is, what is that? Um, we don't know exactly. It is the vision. It is the vision by European uh, Commission to give Europe a global lead in scientific data. I'm now reading this infrastructure and to ensure that European scientists reap the full benefit of data-driven science. You know, this is one of these sentences with a lot of buzzwords inside. We make it short, but it's crisp. And it's all about fair data. And the, the premise is, is that the European Commission thinks if data is presented as fair, this is a, a consequence, an automatic consequence. So as soon as everyone is is publishing their data and make it available, findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable, it will be good science. Okay. As long as we believe this, we get money from them. So we let them believe this. Good. Fine. Good. Uh, this is a, a typical picture from a European Commission um, a commissar or something. So what they do is, in order to make sure that no more member states are leaving the European Commission, like Britain is currently doing, they present pictures which show what a mess currently there is, and they, they kind of reorder the picture to show that as soon as they touch something, it's by far better in the future. So, um, but this is kind of, there is some reality in this picture. It is about the fragmentation and uneven access to information. You know, you, what we have to handle in Europe, it's not the United States, which is one country. What we have to handle in Europe is that we have still the member states, and the member states are autonomous. That means there is no way to force France to open their data to Germany. And they will certainly not do that, as long as you don't pay them. 
and so forth. The same is true between the different sciences. So all the different sciences, like the, the, the laser science, the high energy physics, and so forth, they protect their data from other sciences. The same is true for big organizations like the European uh, Space Agency, like the European Expel uh, or CERN and so forth. They do not give access to other sciences as well because it's their data and it makes them important. Okay. So and this is something European Commission wants to change. And you know, this picture is now looking by far nicer. Uh, so what they do is they, they envision to have a cloud which can even be supported by industry and where certain uh, e-infrastructures like the European grid infrastructure, EUDAT, GEON for networking and open air for publications are working together. They come up with a service catalog and there is an, an European open science portal. So it's very, very, very easy. If you want to do science, you go through the portal, you see all the data which is available from all sciences and there's a catalog of a service catalog for services and for data and you just have to plug them together and you can do everything you want. So if you are a high energy physicist, you can take data from astronomy and you can take this in order to do something with it together with your high energy physics data, if you want. That is the, the vision and they're working on this for, for a decade and mid of November, there will be this big red button in Vienna and somebody is going to push that and this is the inauguration of the European Open Science Cloud. Good. So this is kind of the, the basis of what we are doing here. And, uh, uh, to, to, to map this to projects, this is now a little bit boring. Um, this is how it looks like. I can make this a little bit faster. Um, the EUDAT and EGI are existing infrastructures. They don't like each other. So what the European Commission is putting on top of is something which is called the European, European Open Science Cloud Pilot. And they are responsible for building the governance model for the European Open Science Cloud, which is only an idea and they force EUDAT and EGI to work together. If they don't, they won't get money in the future. Full stop. Next is, there, is a, there has been a series of projects which were supposed to reduce the amount of software available and to focus on software which is really helpful. Because in the past, kind of before um, 2010, the European Commission was essentially funding all scientific projects which, are, which were producing um, software. They were just paid, give the money to them. And this stopped. I, I will show you how they did this. And then, very interesting is that uh, we now start a pre-procurement process with the Hel with Helix Nebula Science Cloud. What we do is, because we want to have industry involved, what we do is we ask industry partners, we give them a catalog of requirements, and we give them money, the first chunk of money, and then they come up with a solution for our requirements. And then we, we start with six or with 10, and then we reduce the amount of partners up to two or three. And those partners then, in the future, from them we can buy without a, a, a public call, uh, or without pu public procurement. So this is a, a negotiation with the European Commission. Usually we would do that, but because they could prove that they will serve our, our, our requirements best, uh, we can just buy from them without extending call or something. And then the EOS Cup is, was just um, uh, um, created. It is the first implementation of the European Open Science Cloud. This ca should cover all of this, but it's a project. It will end at some point. And this is, uh, this is intended because EOS should be something which is, which is actually carried by the labs and by the infrastructures and should not be in the future funded by the C European Commission. And then in order to have use cases on top of EOS Cup are Users, for example, here we have Escape, this is High Energy Physics, this is CERN, this is a new project starting 1st of January 19. We have uh, the, the PANOS, which is the Photon and Neutron Science, Open Science Cloud, and we are just continuing the pre-procurement stuff, which is, which is something which is called Archiver, which is on archiving infrastructure data. Good. So this is how the European Commission is actually planning to implement this U European Open Science Cloud. Then now, as this is a storage conference, focusing on storage now. Um, as I said, uh, 2010, the European Commission was funding too many storage projects. So all the software was funded. Now, what they called, they, they initiated a project which was called European Middleware Initiative, and they had this n n nice description which says, we want to harmonize uh, software which essentially meant we want to throw away as much as possible. 
because there is competition and we will only pick the one who's winning the competition. This is what they call harmonize. And that worked nicely. Um, you, you, you notice how successful this was by the amount of money spent in those projects. This got 20 million, this only 10 million, and here we are with 3 million. So it, it, it's got less and less and less, but the output is getting more and more and more. So this is a kind of a proof of, of, of concept. So this is a little bit boring. Here we, did, here we tried to deploy the remaining uh, components which came from EMI, deploy on public and private cloud, which all those which failed were just kicked out. And then here we split into a, a storage. The Extreme Data Cloud project is about storage, and the Hyper Data Cloud project is about computing. So they split it again, and this only gets three million euros, which for a project is just, it's almost nothing. So you cannot really fund, um, I mean, if you're from industry, you cannot fund development with three million euros. This is impossible. It's by far more expensive. Good. So, and you're talking about this one, because this is about data. Good. Um, a, a small uh, sheet sheet, um, eight partners, seven countries, seven research communities are represented, plus the European credit infrastructure, the budget, as I said, three millions, and it's about 27 months. Okay. So we have to do a lot in this time, short time. What are we supposed to do? What we want is, it's a, it's, it's a software development, but this is a bit misleading, it's mostly integration. So the development has been restricted by the European Commission to increase the readiness level only. So we cannot create new software here. So there has to be a readiness level of six, and we can increase this to eight. So that's all we can do, not more, in terms of development. It ha we have to develop, develop doesn't mean software development, but we have to create a scalable technology to federate European resources and to make it distributed over overall Europe. Um, and of course, this is one of these advertisement sentences, we have to focus on efficient policy-driven and quality of service-based data management. And the target has to be the European Open Science Cloud. So we are not, we are not developing towards something, but we are to developing towards science infrastructures, in particular the European Open Science Cloud. Good. Now, these are the research communities uh, involved. You want to make a picture? Okay, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Good. So, but this is a nice picture as well. So, uh, involved are is, is, is astronomy, the photon science, the, la the lasers, uh, high energy physics, at CERN, um, the LHC, bio -e ecosystems, and a little bit of medicine. Good. So, most interesting are those two. Um, I am actually from this laboratory. We have this huge laser, a huge X-ray laser, and I'm involved in high energy physics as well, uh, at CERN. Good. So I'm, I'm in this context, I'm the work package leader of work package four, which is the, the actual uh, joint research joint research activity. Right. Good. So as I said, the, the now uh, focusing on work package four, what we want to do is we want to implement a configurable data workflow orchestration in entire Europe. That means it's, it, each single word is very important here. So. You have to be able to configure it, and it's an, a workflow orchestration. Data is flowing according to a workflow you, you specify. Good. We, we have to solve the caching, because it's Europe. You have latency in, in networking, but that's rather boring. We skip that. Uh, next is important. Um, because of the high data rates and the, uh, our ability to scale, we have to work with events. So as soon as someone is giving us data, we have to produce a, an event so that someone else can do something with this data, and we expect someone else to inform us if he should do something with the data. We come to this in a second. Um, these are event-based um, uh, event based storage. Okay. And we have to federate heterogeneous data resources. This is as well very interesting, but it doesn't really fit into this presentation. So and it, it's just federating data. Good, starting with the orchestration. As an example, I, I, I will present the European um, X-ray free electron laser. Okay. So anyone not heard about the European x -Fel? No, really? Really? <laughs> Good. But it's a, very, it's a very long thing. Good. So this is a, a kind of a map of the European x -Fel. So here at DAISY, we are creating electrons, a lot of electrons. And then we are accelerating those electrons to this point here, and there we convert electrons to photons. 
and then we let them fly to, to the point here. We have 11 beam lines, and then we are shooting those X-ray beams, photons, on whatever you like. You can buy this. You can, if you send us a proposal, you can get this beam, beam line for a day or a week or so. It's even for free. Good. And you pay your travel. Good. Um, how do you convert electrons to photons? Anyone knows that? It, this is a laser. This entire thing is a laser. <laughs> now what you do is you have, um, so whenever an electron is actually going around. As they drop down one level, right? They emit a photon. So, um, so whenever the speed or direction of an electron is changing, it has to emit a photon. Exactly. So, and if you do this like, like in this wobbling way, you do, you do this here. So around the curve, and it's emitting a photon here. And then you do it again here. And then the photon from here hits the other, the other bob, and so forth, and so forth, and so forth. And you're creating a very, very, very intensive beam. Really, really intensive. It has to be intensive. It has to be very, very monochromatic, which you achieve by tuning all this properly. And it has to be very, very short. Why? Because if you take a picture from some, something, like a cell, and you shoot with photons, it will, of course, explode. So you have to take the picture before it explodes. So therefore, the, 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 the shot has to be very, very short. Otherwise, you're only making pictures of exploding cells, which you don't want. OK, good. So this is what we are doing here. Um, this is from the web page of the European XFL. It, uh, it generates ultra-short X-rays, uh, 27K per K hertz per second, which is quite a lot. Uh, and the brilliance is what they say, billion times higher. So the brilliance is not just the, the, the light, but it is the, the shortness of the beam, and it is the, uh, the, the monochromatis, monochromatism, so to say. Yeah. Okay. It just has one wavelength, exactly one wavelength. Good. But this is all for physicists, and this is for us here. Um, what it produces is, it is, we expect 100 to 500 petabytes per year in full operation. And I mean, this is not yet Google, but it's already a bit, especially because you have to store this. Huh? Good. And um, if you have 11 beam lines, you can imagine what that means. Good. Now, how are we doing this? Um, so each, this is a beam line. This is a very conservative beam line. So you have the CCD. Um, you have a, the online system, which is actually doing all the magic with this, the, the CCD chip and the changing of the probes and all this magic you have to do. Um, so because we can, we can measure various types of probes. You can me measure crystals, or you can measure powder, which is coming, coming from the ceiling, and then we, we shoot on the powder. And then we have to reconstruct what the atoms look like, or the molecules look like. Very complicated. And then you have the burst handling, because what we do is, um, as you have to change the probes, um, you have some time to collect data. So while the probes are in and while you are shooting, the data is coming with a high data rate. But then for the same amount of time, you have some time to store the data. So what you do is you have burst, hand burst handling systems which make it cheaper. So you can buy an either an extremely expensive GPFS, or you can buy a, just a slightly less expensive GP GPFS and do the burst handling. Good. Now on the other side, you have the offline storage where you do the individual analysis. So all the scientists are sitting there waiting for their data, and then they do something with the data. Like they're reconstructing the crystals, or they try to find the, they're trying to sell in the picture, and, and so forth and so forth. All the analysis you have to do on pictures. Good. And what's happening in between? And this is something we are, as the ecstasy, are presenting to XFL in order to be implemented between the burst handling and the offline storage. So what we do is, this is the, 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 the heart of the entire system. It's, it's a system which takes a template, and the template is describing exactly what should go on with your data. Huh? And the template is fed into the orchestrator, and the orchestrator is using an OpenStack instance together with storage in order to build this. Okay. So no, none of the scientists of the XFL ever thought about how to build the system. It is just put in the Tosca template. What you usually have is you have a scientist who has to do an experiment. What do they do? They come up with their probe. They come up with their detector. And then they think of, shall we use NetApp or shall we choose, choose IBM? Or you know, they put all these bits and pieces together again and again and again. So 
every time someone is coming up with something, they have a data management expert, a super expert, without this person nothing works, and they are building, this person is then building this. Well, you don't need that, because you essentially have everything available. You only put everything you need into the Tosca template, and then the Tosca template is using OpenStack, Kubernetes, Mesos, and all these kind of bits and pieces, and building this system. And what the system does in this case is, as soon as data arrives here in the burst handling system, it gives an event to the orchestrator. The orchestrator gets the event and knows no new data arrived. And what it does, it is talking to the calibration system and it's using a function as a service, as an example, um, with a server, serverless approach. I don't know if you're familiar with this. Um, at least it is talking to a, co a, a computing system and it's making sure that the data which is arriving here, file by file by file, is analyzed. What the, the calibration is doing is, first of all, it tries to find out, is the picture empty? Or is it mis misaligned? Or, you know, all these things which you can do very, very fast, if you're clever. And then, as soon as you know there is a picture and it is useful, then you do try to, to, to fragment it. So if you make a picture of a bone, you're trying to find out with artificial intelligence if that's a bone and there's a nail in it, or it's broken and so forth. You know, you can all do this in the calibration already. Good. And then as soon as the, the data arrives offline, in offline storage, the orchestrator, if advised so, it says, okay, this picture is of importance, we just store it on tape or we make it permanent. So this is done by the orchestrator on feedback of the calibration system. And then in the very, very end, because we cannot store all the data of everyone who comes every day, so we, we give advice to one of the data transfer services to transfer the data to Lyon or to London or wherever they came from. Okay, so and all this is actually encrypted or in, put into this Tosca template. And if you want to do it differently, if you have two calibration steps, or if you want to make it not permanent, but you want to throw it away, or whatever you want to do with it, it's just in the Tosca template. And, and this is what the European Commission actually wants. They don't want millions and millions being spent by people who do the same again and again and again. Okay. So this is the idea. Okay. And this is an example. And um, if we are lucky, just tomorrow we talk to the European Commission. This will be shown during the inauguration in Vienna in November, this, this example. Good. Uh, and as I said, this is all based on the Tosca template. Now, just as a sidetrack, because we need this later, I said that if we find out that the file is of importance, uh, you might not want to store it on a disk system only. So what you do is the, uh, the orchestrator tells the online storage to move it to permanent archive. Okay. So from the technical perspective, this is a data, data transfer into another system. But from the logical perspective, this is different. You are simply changing the, the storage quality of your data. Right? So this is only the technical implementation. But imagine you have NetApp. You can tell the NetApp. Now, within this NetApp, uh, just using it as an example, um, please make a third or fifth copy somewhere else. And the NetApp would do this for you. So you are not actually actively transferring data, but you tell the endpoint to change the quality because the file is important. So we have to remember that. Good. Um, just for you, as a recap, so technologies we used in the picture before was an, an IBM GPFS, a multi-tier storage system, which is called Dcache. Storage events are Kafka and the storage sent events. Um, um, cloud management framework on containers was OpenStack and Docker. Serverless, we are, used the, we are using OpenDisk. Um, uh, other companies are present, uh, providing other services uh, doing the same. Uh, wide area transfers, we are using uh, tools from CERN, uh, same for storage federation. And the orchestrator is something which is, is a result of a former project which was called Indigo. And uh, Indigo together with the CERN product which is doing data management is the heart of the system. This is what we call orchestrator. You know, all this existed and therefore it's only three million. If that would not have existed, uh, there was, would be no way to do that for the money. Good. Uh, coming back to the quality of service and storage. So this is a topic I like very much because um, you all know this already. So when you talk to Amazon and you store data in Amazon, you know that you can choose S3 or you can choose Glacier. It has a different price uh, but a different quality. So if you want to get your data back from S3, it comes right away. If you want to get your data back from Glacier, it takes a while. It can take a day or something, or hours, depending on what you buy. 
So you have this kind of balance between different qualities like access latency, retention policy, how safe is my data, and the price. Mm -hmm. And this is true for almost all storage. For the one in my age, what we did in the past, we always called the computer center and said, you know what, I need this pipe, and at the end of this pipe, there has to be a tape, or there has to be a disk, or there have to be two disks, and so forth, and so forth. So we actually communicated this via telephone. Uh, you can't do that anymore. So what you want is, you want to specify the quality when writing the data. Okay. And there's no other way than kind of finding something which you can automate, where an engine can talk to the endpoint and determine actually where is the data stored and how safe is it and I want to have the better storage and so forth. You know that you have to do this automatic. Um, and in this example I'm using the worldwide LHC computing grid. Um, I mean you all know CERN, you all know the LHC. Yeah? It even has to be, has been mentioned in the um, Big Bang Theory. So you should all know about this. Good. So at CERN there is a, a big machine which is 30 something kilometers in, uh, in size and at, at the four edges of, this, of, the, of the circle, uh, there are detectors. And this is one of the detectors. Yeah? And it, you have no idea how large this is, except that you find the standard physicist here. As soon as you notice that is a standard physicist, we use them for, for all kind of scaling, um, you know how big this thing is. This is enormous. And the data output is just ridiculous. Good. And because in the end, just recap what it does. So it's 27 kilometers, uh, it has four detectors, 10,000 people are working in this infrastructure. So you can imagine a little bit of management here. Uh, we are shooting protons and antiprotons against each other. This is kind of a, a dirty physics because we do not know exactly what's coming out, but at least they found the Higgs. Or we are shooting protons on, a, on atoms and trying to find bigger, bigger atoms, so we make them bigger, bigger. Good. Um, we are handling 40, 40 million collisions per second which is a lot, um, and because we need even more, what we do is, so bunches of protons and antiprotons are, are hitting each other, huh? but because they, they're a lot, what we in, did in the past is we made sure that in these bunches only one proton hit one uh, anti, an, antiproton. But we need more events, so what we do now is we make them so dense that per crossing, 20 of those hit each other. It is as if you would make, if you go to a wedding, and because you want to save your SD card, what you do is you take 20 pictures of all the people there on one picture. And then at home, you try to kind of get all those pictures out of this one picture. So this is what we are doing here. You can imagine this takes quite some CPU time. Okay. So this is where all our money is spent. But there's no other way, because you only have, this thing is only running for 10 years, and if you need a particular number of events, you have to have 20 per bunch crossing. Otherwise, you, you won't manage that. Good, so if, statistics. Good. Um, this is not very impressive. Right now, they are producing 15 petabytes per year. But they already do this for 10 years. Uh, but there's a high luminosity upgrade planned within two years. And then we have 10 times that data, right? This is when you have this 20 bunch crossing, 20 hits per bunch crossing. And the, the LHC is actually the first time that you have a worldwide distributed computing system. And that was really a burden. And this was not because we thought that might be a good idea, but it is because all the countries are saying, we are not sending money to CERN. Whatever analysis we do, we do this in France, we do this in Germany, so there was no other way than to build a distributed system. You could, you could have done this for half the price if you would have sent the entire money to CERN and let them build a big computer center. But the outcome is the grid and the cloud. So this is actually a kind of a spin-off of, of, of this idea, I would say. Good. Um, that's a bit boring now here, because you cannot read it anyway. Um, so, so the idea of, of storing uh, the data, the LHC data, now coming back to quality of service around the world, is that you have to have one copy at CERN on tape and two copies somewhere else in two different places, just to make sure that you're not losing the data. It's even by law that you have to do this. And then, of course, as, as you want to do computing, it has to be on disk as well. But because disk is so expensive, you cannot have the entire stuff on disk. So you always have to have something on tape and something on disk. And then you're moving this back and forth and back and forth because you can only work on data which is on disk. Okay, so 
This is essentially where the idea of quality of service came up the first time. And we did not solve it properly. We only solved it kind of intuitively at that point. And we really called it tape and disk, uh, which is, was good at that time. So we have on disk, we have 370 petabytes now, and on tape, about the same. Um, and we are transferring about one exabyte per year around, around the world. This is, uh, that is already OK. This can be compared with um, Facebook, not with Facebook, or with Amazon, maybe. Good. Now, this is what I actually, what I just said. We have 11, 11 sites where we have disk and tape storage, and 250 sites with disk-only storage. And whenever we want to change the quality of, of, of the storage, we have to move data between those sites. And the reason is that we cannot afford to have everything on disk. OK, um, <coughs> this is not so important. And now we come to service level agreements. The one where data is on tape are not supposed to lose data. On sites where data is only on disk, we can lose data at any time. That's an agreement. Okay. And that's fine. So um, it's, it's not a big mess. You, you lose the site, it starts burning or something. And it's, if it's one of those so-called tier twos where we have it only on disk, no one cares. Because we do have it on tape. We make sure that it's then redistributed as soon as the site is up again. Now, the disadvantage of the idea with tape and disk is that, first of all, there are only two qualities. Secondly, the quality description is tied to the storage technology, which is, of course, wrong. Because tape and disk is actually a, 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 a technology and not a quality. And the reason is that, and then the consequence of this is that as soon as you want to change the, the quality at your site, a, a central system has to start copying data between disk and tape. But this is completely pointless, because you would actually only need to, to ask the storage system to change the quality. Good. And then the, the, the last part has something to do with the cost, and this is why uh, WLCG, CERN, is now trying to change this. Um, what we pledge, what the sites are pledging towards CERN, is the amount of disk. But this doesn't say anything, because it could be a JBOT, it could be a RAID system, it could be something very sophisticated. So the, the big sites, they're usually pledging a gigabyte, and what they mean is a gigabyte rate system, and the universities, because they don't have that money, they actually pledge one gigabyte, and they mean JBOT. Okay, good, and in particular, universities can offer very cheap storage, because they, it's maintained by, by students. They don't cost anything, but they disappear after a year, and then there might not be the next student, or it's, he, the student is coming later or something, and then the entire system is kind of in a, in a kind of demon state, uh, zombie state. Good. So therefore, this is, this is not transparent, and this is actually not fair. Good. Better would be you, we define a small set of qualities, and we don't call them like a technology, but we call them, for example, super custodial or scratch or something, that people understand what you actually buy with it. Okay? And uh, for example, if, if, a, if a site is offering super custodial, we leave it to them if that is either two tape copies on different, uh, in different buildings or four disk copies in different buildings. It's, it's up to them. We do the same Amazon does with Glacier. They don't tell you where the data is. They only tell you the probability of data loss. That's it. This is this number with this kind of 29s at the end. Okay. This is what we tell them. All the rest, it's none of their business. And we can even change it without telling them. Okay. Good. Um, and each site would only publish the classes they support. For example, Super Custodian, at Sketch, and so forth. Um, that would make the, the accounting fair and transparent. On the technical level, um, if, if you need to change, the, um, the, for example, the, the retention policy or the access latency, um, you only would have to send a message to that storage system, and the storage system would do it for you. There's no data transfer involved. Maybe there is one involved, but we don't care. We leave it to the side. Good. So this is something we promised. XSC promised this to the communities. So what do you have to do in, in order to do that, first of all? We have to agree on a set of properties so that we are talking all the same language. If we end up with everyone calling it differently, again, that is a pointless exercise. OK, so for example, we call it retention policy or access latency. It doesn't really matter how we call it. OK, plus we have to define the values for these keys. Okay. Secondly, we need a protocol or API to communicate those properties. So because everyone wants to talk the same protocol to the endpoints and tell them, I want to have this and that latency. So that's the second thing we need. Third, to convince people, you need a reference implementation. 
you have to prove at least once that you can do that. Okay? Number three, uh, number four, um, of course you need a demo. You have to show the European Commission this is, all this is done and we can do it. Okay, good. Step by step. There is a wonderful organization which is only talking vocabulary. This is the Research Data Alliance. Ever heard about the Research Data Alliance? The advantage of this organization, it's worldwide. Obviously, that's not true because you don't know it. And the, but the advantage is really they have, all, they have meetings at wonderful places in the world. So you should really, really join this. The next, I'm, I'm looking forward to November, then they meet in Botswana. So I think this is a really nice place. Um, but now, putting that aside, um, they, what they do is the European Commission act, accepts them as a body for defining things because almost all countries in the world are member of that organization. So you can be sure that there's always a representative of a particular, of all languages, of, of all countries being present so that there's no double work done. They want to avoid that the US and, and Europe are doing the same thing, but calling it differently. Therefore, they, they actually support this. Good. Um, this is what I said. We, we created a, a, a working group there. It's called Storage Definition Working Group. And then we have four meetings every second week. And so we hope to collect realistic use cases for those things from the different communities, because all the communities, thank you, are present. Next, we, we want to, we are using RDA, Research Data Alliance, to advertise our idea of quality of service. So it's both ways, we, we, we get what we, we can, we try to get what they provide to us, and we actually advertise our ideas. Good, the next is the communication protocol. And yes, we are here. You can imagine what we have been choosing. Uh, it is the, it's CDMI. CDMI is a horrible protocol, I, if I say that. But the advantage is, it is a, it is a, it's a standard, it's accepted as a standard. So um, as the European Commission is pushing for standard, we decided to go for CDMI. And uh, um, it, it provides what we need. It has object, it has containers, which maps to directories, and it has attributes and capabilities. So which maps to like access latency and retention policy, and the capabilities is a collection which we call a class. Good, that's sufficient for us because data transfer we are doing in any way in as we like. So we are not interested in data transfer, we know how to transfer data. Good, so and then some bits and pieces needed to be fixed and David Slick was very helpful. So uh, he helped us kind of, he, he submitted one extension to the CDMI protocol and we, ex we submitted another one which actually made this complete. Um, exactly, good. This is exactly what I just said. So we became member of SNIA in order to do that, but since today we, don't have, we wouldn't have to do that anymore because now you can uh, submit uh, changes even without being a member. Doesn't matter. Okay, so we submitted our proposal, it was accepted, and we called into the bi-weekly meetings and so forth. And now, and what we did is we cleaned up the reference implementation. It was not so useful, I would say. Uh, so we, we fixed bits and pieces and now on the official SNIA CDMI reference implementation, you can choose another branch, which is the Indigo implementation. And uh, it has some advantages. No, where are the advantages? Gone. Maybe they're still coming. So I don't know how familiar you are with the CDMI, but it doesn't really matter so much. Important is that they pr in SNIA, uh, CDMI provides attributes for files. And some of those attributes are useful for us. Data retention, geographical placement is important, latency is important, and all those things which are related to the quality of data. So we took those, but we didn't want to specify all of those, a combination of those, when we talk to a file or when we talk to an endpoint. So uh, with the extension of David, we, we actually put them, a combination of those, into capabilities and gave the capabilities names. For example, custodial would mean that the data retention is something with a lot of nines, and the latency would be one hour. And if you have the capability online, you, it might not be that safe, but the latency is only one millisecond. So you just, it's just an arbitrary number you only have to agree on, you know, those things. But from now on, you can use the capabilities instead of the combination of those attributes in order to talk to your system. Right, okay, advantage. Good. Now, what we can do is, this is, this is cherry picking. What we do is we want to ask the system what capabilities do you provide and if it returns I support 
custodial, then you can ask the system, what does it mean? And it returns the attributes of the custodial part we choose. Secondly, whenever we do a, a create, um, read, read not, but update and delete operation, we can specify, um, using CDMI, we can specify a, 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 a capability, and when writing a file, the capability, the capability is taken by that file. So if you say it has to be custodial, then the file is written to tape. I'm lying. We can't do that. The reason is we cannot create a file. We cannot specify those capabilities using non-CDMI, but we are writing files using WebDAV or NFS or something. And NFS and WebDAV does not allow us to specify a, a, a capability. So what we do is, in order to kind of circumvent this a little bit, we are creating a directory using CDMI, and we inherit the attributes of the directory, or the capabilities. Okay, good. Cheating a little bit, but this is more important here. We can use CDMI to change the capability of a file. So if you're writing it to tape, and then we need it on a fast disk, so then we change the capability of the file. We can do that with CDMI, and it's then somehow magically moving to disk. Okay, um, and we can watch that. Uh, as long as the CDMI capability target attribute is there, we know that the, this is only a target. That means it, isn't, it wasn't achieved yet. As soon as this um, attribute disappears, we know now it's done. Now it will be on disk. But you know, it's by far more complicated, and it's pages and pages of specification, things um, David Slick likes so much. I don't. But we can do this. Good. And a typical CDMI communication would, like, would like, look like this. Uh, a human or a framework is asking the storage system, what can you do for me? It says, I support custodial online, custodial and online. And then the system can ask, so what is custodial and what is online? And it provides the attributes. And then it says, please create a container with capability custodial. Boom, done. And then write a file into that container. And that container is then custodial, which translates to tape, maybe. And then in the end, it can say, if you like, Please change the file capability to online. And the, the file is then coming back from tape to disk. Okay. So this is exactly what we want. So we have been abstracting the quality of the storage using um, the vocabulary from RDA and using the protocol CDMI from SNIA. Good. Oh, this is what we fixed in the SNIA implementation. Here it is. So the Indigo extension of the SNIA reference implementation now has the OpenID Connect authentication. It's using a modern Spring Boot framework from Java, and it is using the Java service provider interface so that you can plug in different endpoints, uh, different uh, technologies. Uh, because this is only, the, the SNIA is only, the SNIA reference implementation is only rendering for the protocol. In the end, it has to talk to something, you know? And you can just plug this in using the, the Java service provider interface. Good, and it looks like this. So this is the, the actual SNIA rendering for the protocol. And here we have the plugin system. Here we have different implementations like HPSS, Ceph, and Dcache. And you can have this plugin talks to HPSS, this to Ceph, and this to Dcache. See, uh, it, cannot, it can only talk to one of those. It cannot not talk to all of them. So if you want to talk to two, you have to have two of those. Okay. Good. Fine. The Uteam European test bed, that's very nice. This was the end of the Indigo project. What we did is we took, we took those technologies and spread them around Europe. So we have in Hamburg, in Poland, in Karlsruhe, at Bari in Bologna and uh, no, at Bari and in Bologna, we had those endpoints with different technologies, and they all are talking. Although they're different technologies, they're all talking CDMI. They're all supporting this protocol. And um, what we did is, we wrote a, a, a really very very simple web server. It, it was just done by a student within a week. What, he, what the web server does, it just collects information about all those endpoints. So we only the the endpoint name or the URL is given to the storage broker, but not the content, not, not the abilities of all those endpoints, only the, the, the URL. And then what the endpoint does, it is building a, a page which we can see later on, and then you can access this page using a framework or a, a command line interface or a web server uh, or a browser. So, and this is the result. It's, I, unfortunately, it's not really easy to read, but I can amplify it a little bit. So here are the infrastructure endpoints. So here this is Karlsruhe, KIT, this is DAISY, and this is P Poland, here this is Poland, and so forth, and Bari, and so forth. So this table is automatically generated. This is not an Excel table. So whenever something changes in the background, when Poland, Poland is adding a new quality of service, this will automatically pop up here. 
And this is just wonderful. I mean, if you know Europe, if you know how complicated it is to store something in another country with another ability or capability, you know that this is kind of, kind of heaven. Uh, because here you can see DAISY is offering this access latency, this number of copies, this storage lifetime, this location, and the available transitions. And this, of course, the, the, the final goal is not that this is showing up in a web page. The final goal is that an orchestrator can read through this. Unfortunately, right now, there's one information missing, which is the price. Because it's just made up. But um, in the end, if a price is reported, then it makes sense for the orchestrator to find the most appropriate storage. Because the scientist just says, I have so much money, and I have to store so much data. Find me something appropriate. And this thing can do that. Good. So, and this is just an example. So you can just you click on DAISY, and it will give you uh, the, the quality of, of storage, quality of service storage uh, ability, and how you can change it. So, um, and you can upload a file, and it's still disk. But then you can go there and say, okay, I want to have this on tape. And then you click there, and you say, should go to tape. And then it's sending a CDMI command to the to the system in Poland, and then it's going to tape. Good. And putting it all together. Now, from the perspective of quality of service, you know, you have this system here, and again, we have the orchestrator, and uh, there is a service which I didn't mention yet, but which is important. There's an SLA service, so you can buy into an SLA. You can say, if I if I'm using storage, I'm allowed to do this and that because I already paid this and that. Okay, so this SLA service is always it's like an authorization service, but it's more sophisticated. So it, it identifies myself, it knows what, how much money I paid, and based on this, it allows me to do things or not. Okay, good. And then it can do now, as it can manipulate all the storage in the world, or in Europe, it can, do, it can start file transfer services. So for example, if you take the quality of service away from the endpoint and put it higher on, on, on Europe, huh, then it can say, okay, it's cheaper to have the file in in Poland than it is in Germany, and then the orchestrator will decide to transfer the, transfer the data to Poland. So this is quality of service, but on the European level, not on the local level. Good. And the second is then, at some point, it can then start and uh, 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 function as a service service on all this. Okay. So we had this already, but seen through the, the classes of, uh, of uh, orchestration, but this is the same seen through the classes of quality of service. Good. <laughs> Almost done. <laughs> Good. So uh, just as a summary, the Extreme Data Cloud project as part of the European Open Science Cloud initiative is providing software to orchestrate data analysis and data movement in the European level. In the order of exabyte, this has been a requirement. And we can do that. We have, we have been proven to do that. So and one of the most in innovative points is the consistency and well-defined quality of storage service, um, allowing the cloud platform layers, the automatic systems, to steer data access latency, retention policy, geographical location, and possible transaction between those. Okay? Uh, and for now, XTC decided to use the extension of CDMI, the CDMI protocol to negotiate quality of service and the transitions between the, the uh, platform as a service layer and the storage providers. Uh, and the quality is, uh, the vocabulary is defined by the Research Data Alliance, and CDMI is uh, by SNIA. And the first results will be adopted by the upcoming Horizon 2020 projects, which are already, uh, which are already approved, and we, which will start 1st of January 19. So almost in time. Thank you very much.